another day, another Judgment Day heavy show. Somebody on my channel, I think it might have been one of the subscribers, uh, asked the question of whether Judgment Day was overexposed. And uh, I said they were getting there. But I think the answer is absolutely yes. Them being on all three brands. And then them, of course, starting and ending Raw every week for like four months. I mean, this is unreal. It's unreal. Like, gee whiz. So, because there was no real news and notes, um, let's talk about this show and get it out of the way. So, clearly, the Judgment Day run WWE, which is they say every single week. We got a Dominic Mysterio hype package, which was nice. Um, uh, Dominic Mysterio came out. He tried to talk. He got cut off by the booze. Then Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn come out there. Kevin Owens complained that we did this last week. That Judgment Day came out there, ran their mouths. Dominic tried to talk. Then uh, he got cut off. Nobody ever wants to hear Dominic talk. So um, they go on about you know Sami Zayn looking like nobody respects Dominic. And he can earn respect if he goes one-on-one -on -one with Sami Zayn. And he puts a title on the line. So Rhea accepted on Dominic's behalf. Because that's what she does. So I thought that was the main event of the evening. And I was about to say, oh, Dominic about to get another main event. Oh, wow. Like, uh, I was on the fence about that. Because he did main event Raw, SmackDown, and NXT last week. I was on the fence about... You know, he also main evented one of the uh, Mexico shows. So he, Mex he main evented a house show, too. That's when they did the uh, the fake title switch where um, Dominic, quote unquote, won the title from Seth Rollins, but the decision was reversed. I think it was in Mexico City. So he had a pretty damn good week in terms of elevating himself on the card. Anyway, uh, we get straight to Dominic versus Sami Zayn, which was a one on one match. It was actually fairly solid. Dominic was in there hanging. It wasn't great. You know, uh, Dominic is still learning. This is only his second or third year in the business. So he's still learning, you know. Um, at one point, everybody was ejected from ringside, which was the right decision to make. Um, Dominic's uh, three amigos is actually getting a little bit better. Clearly, he's improving in some ways. Um, next, you see Kevin Owens roly-poly just tumbling outside. <laughs> Just a mass of gray beard, just whoo, is laying around on the floor. So Sami Zayn is distracted by this. Dominic Mysterio rolls him up, pulls the tights, gets the win, escapes through the crowd. Sami Zayn doesn't care, jumps up, chases off Judgment Day, who was Damian Priest and <clears throat> Rhea Ripley. Um, so Dominic wins. We don't see him no more for the rest of the night until the main event, and then we got. Uh, Kevin Owens backstage, supposedly injured. Now, supposedly, um, he has a legitimate injury, um, which would explain why they haven't been in a feud or anything. But, I mean, come on. there's You have nothing planned for these guys. It's just been Sami Zayn versus, and Kevin Owens versus the Judgment Day, and it's been brutal. I can tell you that stuff's been brutal. Ugh. I'm sorry, uh, Dominic, we did see him later, because we saw him uh, run into Apollo Crews later, um, and uh, he ended up, we ended up with Apollo Crews versus Damian Priest out of this thing, because Apollo Crews was going to be the, the the good Samaritan. He's going to stand up when nobody else would. He's tired of Judgment Day pushing people around, acting like they're tough guys. So then Rhea Ripley scared off Akira Tozawa, because we're running with that gag still. Um... And Apollo Crews lost to Damian Priest in a match nobody cared about because we had to get Damian Priest on TV because he hasn't wrestled in a while. So he won. Uh, what did Apollo Crews do to his people? Like, who did he piss off? That he's just been, you know, I remember he had that soft push in like 2020, 2021 when he won the U.S. title and he was feuding with MVP. You know, there seemed to be something going on there. Then he turned heel. Yeah, it's like he was, he was doing good. And then the bottom fell out. Like, it just all went away. Everything. The cool entrance, the accent. If you wanted to drop the accent, you could have just dropped the accent. 
But everything cool about him just vanished. It just all left. And NXT turned him into, I don't know, the Equalizer. I don't know what the hell he was trying to do. That's so Raven. Some kind of witch. I don't know. Apollo Crews, boy. Oh, boy. Tough being Apollo Crews these days. That's <laughs> just tough. All right, so for Finn, uh, so for Rhea Ripley, because we got to talk about Judgment Day as as a whole here. Um, she had a match set up with Liv Morgan. So Liv Morgan says that Raquel Rodriguez has a serious knee injury. The claim was that Liv Morgan was the last person to pin Rhea Ripley, and so she's expecting to do the same tonight. She says that nobody's going to be able to stop her. And it she is she might get beat up, but she might not. So there's a lot of uh, <laughs> there's a lot of confidence you got there, kid. I might get beat up, but maybe I won't. Also, Liv Morgan is smiling a lot. I know that that's what they WWE wants, but I really, really, really need baby faces to not smile when you one just lost a championship, two just lost a match in general. Three, have an injured friend. You probably shouldn't be smiling. You should be serious, you know. We need appropriate uh, body reactions, appropriate emotions for these scenes. You come across like a psychopath when you're laughing at everything. Like, literally all the time, nothing can bring you down. I get it that, you know, you want your baby faces to to be uh, upbeat and all this kind of stuff, but no. You have appropriate responses because then people when you re- have an appropriate response then people feel like you know their anger and frustration or whatever is validated when you don't care they don't care and Liv Morgan sitting here grinning about her friend being injured and she still gets to fight uh, Rhea Ripley I'm like ah. I know they do this all the time so it's not just a, a Liv Morgan problem just a WWE babyface in general problem. I really wish they would get out of that. If Triple H has any authority, that's going to be need to be one of the top things we get rid of. Is babyfaces smiling through everything? It's okay to frown. It's okay to, to have real human emotions and be upset about stuff and to not like things. All right. So speaking of <laughs> not liking things, uh, as Liv Morgan walked off. Rhea Ripley showed up because apparently they couldn't have bumped into each other. They was in a narrow hallway. She said she took out uh, Raquel Rodriguez and Liv Morgan is next because she told them to mind their own business. Um, So then the match is about to happen. Liv Morgan is doing her entrance and she's uh, assaulted by Rhea Ripley who attacks from the blind side. Um, It was a short attack, but it ended with Rhea Ripley tying a chair around Liv's arm and then she was stomped. Then she did it again. So she pilmanized the arm twice and Liv is super selling this thing and she's crying and she's really putting it over. And Rhea's screaming at her that this is her world now. You know, uh, have fun in rehab. (laughs) Which was great. Um, They showed backstage Liv Morgan couldn't even lift her arm. She was weeping. Uh, there was a discussion about whether Liv was really injured or not. And of course, uh, I think one of the dirt sheets said that she has a movie role. And I'm like, did anybody, everybody forgot that, you know, this Hollywood thing is happening. Hollywood is burning right now. What? Well, maybe I think certain, well, it is true that certain, uh, producers are still working because they have capitulated to the union. So certain places are still doing movies, but they're not going to tell you that because then you are you wouldn't feel sorry for the actors if they told you the truth. So, uh, Liv Morgan is either off to do a movie or this was just an angle to put Rhea Ripley over, but this was a very strong. It was a very strong segment to get Rhea Ripley over. I thoroughly loved it. Of course, we asked the question, who is going to fight Rhea Ripley? Is she not going to have a match at SummerSlam? Because it's not looking like it. Unless, you know, she's going to fight both of them with one arm and one leg apiece. But that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to me like Rhea Ripley's just going to be with Dominic that, that on SummerSlam. Or she might just be hanging out with Finn Balor. And, 
I know there's going to the stopwatch brigade is not going to be happy about that. All right. The stopwatch gods are not going to be happy that, you know, uh, Rhea Ripley will not have a championship match at SummerSlam. I personally just kind of shrug at it. Just wanted, just wanted to know what's going on. Just wanted to be abreast of the situation. It ain't looking good. It ain't looking like nobody's going to be in a position to do anything to Rhea Ripley to get that spot either. All right. So the closing segment was Finn Balor and, um, Seth freaking Rollins face to face. Uh, this was very generic. Just a very generic thing. Not really worthy of the spot they were putting it in. Finn Balor kept trying to talk, but the geeks wouldn't stop singing Seth Rollins theme song. He just talked about how they were both professionals and they want to handle it like professionals. Uh, Seth Rollins claimed that Finn Balor had no shot and that even if he did win by some miracle, Damian Priest would just cash in on him anyway. Um, he says, of course, you would do the same to him. Near the end of the segment, Seth Rollins was jumped by Judgment Day. And uh, <laughs> Sami Zayn tried to help him, but it wasn't enough. So Judgment Day is standing tall at the end of the segment. But Christ on a cracker, we just got so much Judgment Day. The thing about the Judgment Day push isn't that I dislike Judgment Day or any individual member of it. It's that it's repetitive. It's literally been the same shtick week after week. At the Judgment Day run WWE. And then they have a opening promo where they get into it with the same people they got into it two weeks ago. Then they have a match with those same people. They win, they lose. Who knows? It's 50-50 booking. Then, you know, it's just been going on. It's been so much of the same shit. It's like, how can you have this storyline with these talented characters and you just keep doing the same damn thing over and over and over again? At some point, even you have to be bored of keep, like, even if it was like a working, you know, structure, like this was like a perfectly well done structure and it nailed it, gets good numbers every time. Even if that was the case, just for something to be a little bit different. Sometimes you can't even tell what fucking week it is because it's the same opening every goddamn week. It's the same opening. It's like mix it up. Do different stuff. You know, please. It's just, it's, it's killing me. It's kicking me in the ass. I can't stand it. It's like, it's making me hate Judgment Day. It's too, it's too much of the same shit. You know, and then you have them wrestling in the same matches against the same people over and over and over again. Like at least Apollo Crews was a fresh opponent, right? So why not give Apollo Crews some spotlight by having him, you know, team up with Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens or team up with two other guys and they want to fight Judgment Day. You know, at least it would have been different, you know, but it's Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens and it's like, oh my God. Uh, again, like what next you gonna fight Kevin Owens next week because we haven't had that match yet. This is so boring. That's incredibly boring. It's formulaic and it's boring. And it doesn't matter how much you like the characters. If you don't like the story that they're in, then it doesn't matter. And the judgment day story right now is quite lame. It's quite lame. So I, I hate to be one of the people who hate the character. So there are some people who don't like these members of Judgment Day, you know? So when it's formulaic and there's no interest in the characters and you don't like the characters already, then you're really having a tough time. At the very least, I like Dominic Mysterio and Rhea Ripley. I think they've been tremendous. Finn Balor has always been tremendous. And Damian Priest, he's coming along, you know? Um, I hate to say, I'm not saying that like Dominic is better than him. I'm saying Dominic is in a better position. You know, he still has far to go in the ring. But he's the youngest member of the group. At least I think so. I think he's younger than Rhea Ripley. And he's the least experienced person in, probably on the entire roster in terms of how much time he's actually had in the ring. But he's getting better week by week because he's getting more time. Which is right. Okay, fine. You want to give Dominic more experience. That's the that's the right thing to do. So I don't mind that he's wrestling Sami Zayn. I just 
I hate the fact that he seemingly has wrestled Sami Zayn four times this month. That's really what's kind of like throwing me for a loop is that it feels like these guys are constantly wrestling the same people. All right, let's go off off away from the judgment day, I, please. So uh, Becky Lynch defeats Zoe Stark. Match was solid. Uh, Trish Stratus interfered a little bit. She's back to wearing the face mask. She's she's on and off with his face mask thing. It's almost like uh, Bob Orton Jr.'s cast, where it was it was on most of the time. It was a gimmick that just lasted on and on and on, right? So she threw the mask in the ring. The referee took it and put it out. She tried to cheat, got knocked off the apron. She ended up uh, countering a spring. Well, I'm sorry. I should correct about the hers and she's a pronouns pal. Becky Lynch countered Zoe Stark's springboard into a manhandle slam and pinned her. So she told a microphone holder lady that this feud is not over until she wins. Um, so now she's very excited about the, the opportunity of wrestling Trish Addis again. Okay. Uh, the match itself was fine. I like that uh, Becky Lynch used the Explorer Suplex after she countered uh, Zoe Stark's finish. Uh, they had a nice little TV match. They weren't trying to do too much. I don't feel like they went too long. So it was, it was fine. I mean, Zoe Stark is still, you know, 100% rice cake but it's a good position for her because she gets to do work rate stuff and becky lynch gets to try to help her out but there's not much you can do in the charisma department you know um that girl gonna need an injection of charisma she gonna have to find some in her pants pockets or you know buy some from you know, buy like a magic potion or something she needs help that trish stratus rub is not going to be enough i can promise you that all right so Cody, Cody cut a promo. He came out there, said that he didn't have Brock Lesnar beating him, beating him up in front of his mom on his bingo card, but said that uh, his mom was not impressed. His mom watched Terry Funk blow fire. His mom saw other wrestlers do some terrible things, but his mom also knew what Brock should know, and that as Brock made a mistake, he left Cody breathing. Then he says that now... He doesn't just want to beat Brock Lesnar. He wants to embarrass Brock Lesnar. Says he's not poking the bear. He's slapping the bear across the face and telling them to come get it. So he says that uh, he's going to smoke him a stogie. And in 20 years, going to sit back and know that he finished this chapter of the story. And that Brock deserved it. All right. This was fine. Really good promo. Uh they they really not doing Cody any favors. Like he's cutting these promos and they're solid, but there's nobody there for him to bounce off of. So he's basically just monologuing, which is fine because he's good at it and he's working the crowd up. The crowd's interested in everything he says. He has good phraseology, you know, like his born, his promos don't last very long because, you know, he, they're not as long as they used to be. You know, I think they're shortening them up now, but um, he's constantly coming across as being the indomitable baby face who just will not give up. He put Pro Brock over a lot, you know, Brock who had less than five fights before he won the UFC title, Brock who never played a game of football ever, <laughs> nearly made a football team, you know, a regular season football team. I think he made the practice squad. You know, he's a freak athlete, bad motherfucker, but, uh, Cody intends to embarrass him anyway. So I'm like, all right. What kind of match are they going to have, though? Because they need a stipulation. Most of these matches need stipulations. I, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to embarrass myself, but I, maybe I'll do it later. Anyway, so Cody's promo was fine. Uh, Ricochet was thrilled that Logan Paul took him up on his offer and will be there, but he couldn't find him. He says that Logan Paul showed up late because uh, he said he's there to say something and he's going to say it to Logan Paul's face. So Ricochet went walking around asking various guys if they seen Logan Paul, which seems to me to be starting trouble. He asked Shinsuke Nakamura as if it's Shinsuke Nakamura's time to look for Logan Paul. Nakamura had no idea why he was, he's being asked about this and said, no, he had not seen Logan Paul. Thank God. Nakamura, what would have happened if you'd have said yes? Um, so Ricochet is waiting for Logan Paul in the ring. 
He said that Logan Paul does not belong in a WWE ring. It's not because Logan Paul isn't good because he is good. Some people think that he's great. Even though, you know, those people should also accept that Ricochet is special. But he doesn't belong there because he's an arrogant prick who doesn't appreciate what they do and the sacrifices that they make. And that he's basically just coming in here, taking up space, and everybody's tired of him. So he challenged him to a match at SummerSlam. And while he was talking, Logan Paul decked him from behind. So now Logan Paul steals Austin Theory's gimmick with the cell phone. And he's doing the selfie thing. He's mocking Ricochet. He starts mocking the audience. He calls one guy a, f- a fat virgin. Told him to go get laid. Um, meanwhile, uh, Ricochet kips up. Kicks Logan Paul in the head. Does a uh, standing shooting star press. And uh, that was pretty much it. After that, Logan Paul said he felt disrespected and that he's going to pop Ricochet's bald head next week. So the the footage that Logan Paul recorded on his phone was actually very good. You can see Ricochet kipping up in the background. You get the, the reaction of him getting kicked in the head, him taking the bump and everything. And you get to see Logan Paul's facial reactions very closely. You also get the impact of the shooting star press. It was very cool. Um, now the, the promo part, uh, Ricochet coming across very generic. And I think everybody feels that how generic this is. Logan Paul doesn't appreciate us. He doesn't understand our sacrifices. It's like anybody can make that argument. You know, like when you're, that's the thing about character development. You're talking about developing characters. One of the things is characters should have unique voices. You know, characters who talk like everybody else talks blend in. That's why the crowd didn't really react to what Ricochet was saying. Because so what is Ricochet saying it? You could have took Ricochet out, put Apollo Crews in, it wouldn't have been any difference. You could have took Ricochet out and put literally any other mid-card babyface with no personality in this spot and it would have been the exact same spot. You know? Um, So... He's got to come up with swag. He's got to come up with a, a way of speaking, a manner of speaking that puts him over, that makes him different and makes him stand out. You know, just try to imagine how different people would have said the exact same thing, but with more flavor, with more swag, with more intensity, with more passion or whatever. And I don't know, maybe it's, he might be getting used to the scripts, but he still ain't putting an extra layer on it. You know, I don't know how many of y'all watch Seinfeld, but the uh, the perfect uh, analogy is, you know, the pretzels are making me thirsty. And that episode of Seinfeld where, where they're saying it in so many different ways, that's really what acting is all about. That's what pro wrestling is all about. You can go out there and cut a generic baby face promo if you want. That's fine. And at some places it might work. But when you're a television, it's millions of people, hundreds, you know, thousands of people in the building. You want to be able to stand out. So you need to be able to come up with a different kind of phraseology. And I know that the script is, you know, ham- hampering you a little bit. But that's when you are out there with a live mic and you got to make it your own. You got to put your own little stank on it. And I don't think Ricochet is coming that, that far yet. So, uh, I just shrug. I'm just going to shrug on this one. Didn't hate it. Didn't love it. Didn't want Didn't really want to see more of it. If we're being honest. All right. So after Ricochet bothered Shinsuke Nakamura, Shinsuke Nakamura turned around and he ran into Tommaso Ciampa. So Tommaso Ciampa says, okay, look, I cost you that match last week. So you kicked me in the face and that's a free one. But this ain't no charity. I don't expect to see you at ringside when I wrestle Bronson Reed. Nakamura didn't say anything. He just did stuff with his hands. Like he was just doing like Doctor Strange stuff with his hands or whatever. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know what that's about. But, uh, you know, <laughs> the rings of Ragador. I don't know. The, uh, by the way of the Vashanti. Um, so Bronson Reed versus Tommaso Ciampa. The crowd did not care until... 
Tommaso Ciampa, all five foot six of him, lifted big tugboat Reed up into an air raid crash. The crowd was then sufficiently very woke. They were wide awake at that point. And then that's also when Shinsuke Nakamura slid out there, still doing things with his hands. And I'm just, you know, I'm like, okay. Uh, it, it, it distracted Tommaso Ciampa. He, of course, gets crushed uh, by the tsunami, loses the match. So they go on with Ciampa and Nakamura as the feud. Uh, but what about Bronson Reed? What are we doing with him? Is he still palling around with the Miz? The Miz was not there tonight. I don't know what's going on. Um, just uh, keeping Nakamura in sort of a holding pattern where he's not a baby face. He's also not fully a heel yet. Um, none of these guys have any momentum. Uh, and it's, un- it's unfortunate because all three of them are somewhat talented guys. But when you're 50-50 booking it with Bronson Reed, win sometimes, lose sometimes. Uh, Champa wins sometimes, lose sometimes. Nakamura wins sometimes, lose sometimes. It's like okay, I don't. We don't care about any of these people, you know. Um, that's why you need to bring back jobber matches where these guys can go in there and squash a bunch of dudes for a few few seconds and then go about doing all this other stuff where they don't look like complete and total losers and bums and shit. You know, it's hard to get people to care about people if they consider bums. You know. All right, so uh, Chelsea Green and Sonya Deville, they were. Upset that uh, the interview guy, I think it was Byron Saxton, wanted to talk to Liv Morgan and wanted to talk to Rhea Ripley. He didn't want to talk to them. Um, he claimed that he talked to them last week. They had attitude. Chelsea Green is wearing like the most ridiculous outfit in the world. I love it. Um, so they got interrupted by Rhea Ripley appearing. So they got completely and totally fake and phony. And then... Uh, Wished her well, doing champ things, and then they left. Um, the only thing that was a bit of a, I guess you could say a bit of a news item, was Matt Cardona popping up at some show wearing the WWE Women's Tag Team title. And so many people thought that Chelsea Green was going to get in trouble, but he was wearing a replica. Like, do you think these people are stupid? They're not. They're not stupid. And plus, it was like in DDT in Japan or something like that. It wasn't like a he was on AEW TV with it. Um, <laughs> this is this is ridiculous. Um, plus, he was playing around with the belt the entire week, so of course he was going to wear something similar. So uh, it was it was a nice little gag. It plays into Matt Cardona's character where he's constantly doing WWE based stuff. But there was a lot of dorks online that was trying to get Chelsea Green in trouble. Like, she's letting her husband use the belt for gimmicks and all this kind of stuff. And it was like, no, she was at some kind of other shindig and she had the belt with her. And he had a <laughs> a replica. And she had to actually address this online. I'm like, why even bother? You know, I don't know. But as long as she ain't pulling a page with that belt, who gives a shit, really? Who gives a damn if Matt Cardona is wearing it somewhere? As long as, you know, it ain't covered in jizz, you know, it ain't covered in woo-woo-woo, then we okay. All right? I think we're doing okay. That's some that's some unnecessary roughness right there. When you cover the belt in woo-woo-woo, nobody wants to, uh, nobody wants that. That's when we start changing the design, of course. That's when we get rid of it. Is uh, you covered the belt in some man gravy. Anyway, moving on. Alpha Academy are disappointed. They're upset that they lost. Uh, Chad Gable says, "Uh, oh, what is Viking rules anyway?" Yeah, what is Viking rules? So then uh, they were trying to make excuses. Then Max Maxine Dupree she interrupted by saying she's been embarrassing Valhalla this entire time. And that she's going to continue to do so and challenge Valhalla to a one-on-one match next week. Valhalla says that the guys are happy. They smile with their whole heart or some some nonsense she was talking about. And then said that she should consult those guys because she accepts Maxine Dupree's challenge. And I'm actually, as long as this is the last match in the feud, I'm okay with it. If this is it... And this, you know, Sarah Logan, Maxine Dupree thing is the last match in the feud. I'm fine with it. 
But if we're going to keep having matches after this, bro, I'm going to say light all of these motherfuckers on fire. All of them. Burn them. Is this the last match? Okay, I'll I'll take it. Because I think we built up to this, and this is something people actually want to see. Because Maxine did the training montage. We've got to see her grow. She's cocky now. She thinks she, she can handle this singles match by herself. You know, Gable and Otis are confident in her. You know, they're still showing that Valhalla is sort of menacing because she put, you know, Maxine through a table. Would have helped if, you know, she hadn't been getting embarrassed the last couple of weeks. But at least they've been building to this. And I can't tell them not to do something they've been building to. So this is fine. Shayna Baszler, she's backstage. She's tired of hearing the name Ronda Rousey and uh, in relation to anything she does. She says, talking is not going to fix this problem. Matches are not going to fix this problem. She's got to settle this thing, and it need only to be settled with a fight. So she's going to fight Ronda Rousey, whatever that means. Because a match and a fight is usually the same thing. They're usually interchangeable, but apparently not now. So Ronda Rousey backstage, just you know, walking back and forth, saying that Shayna Baszler cannot challenge her to a fight. Because Ronda Rousey does not have a fight. When she fights, it is the fight. And she accepts Shayna Baszler's challenge. And that was it. That was pretty simple. Okay. Uh, they kept it simple. Can't complain. All right. So, Gunta and uh, Drew McIntyre. This was an interesting uh, piece of business here. Because Drew McIntyre wanted Gunter to defend the title tonight. Gunther called the crowd degenerates. <laughs> said that. <laughs> it's unacceptable for him to defend the Intercontinental title, the title with so much prestige in front of these degenerates. Then he called uh, Drew McIntyre a failure, so he never finishes anything. He said he didn't finish the job at Clash at the Castle. He didn't finish the job at WrestleMania. He's not going to finish the job at SummerSlam. So Drew McIntyre decided to go story time again. What history lesson with Drew McIntyre? That him and Sheamus, their their childhood friends. Well, apparently Drew McIntyre was nineteen and Sheamus was forty, according to Drew McIntyre. And they always had dreams of wrestling each other at WrestleMania. And the triple threat match was the first time they ever got an opportunity to do that. And they were wrapped up in their personal issue. And then Gunter just slid in and stole the match. Which is what they expected him to do. But now, at SummerSlam, it's the two of them, mano y mano. What is he going to do? So then, Ludwig Kaiser slid into the scene. How dare you? And he went on about, you know, um, Drew McIntyre disrespecting the ring general. So then, Drew McIntyre says, like, I like you. You, I like you. You got Moxie. You got charisma. You should be the leader of Imperium. And for some reason, the crowd is cheering this. The crowd is cheering that. Gunter is like, hmm. <laughs> and the crowd is cheering this. So Drew McIntyre, of course, because Ludwig Kaiser spoke up, decides, okay, how about you fight me tonight since Gunter won't fight me? And... Uh, he didn't necessarily accept it, but the match was made. Uh, Ludwig Kaiser versus Drew McIntyre. And Kaiser got more offense in than I would have expected, despite the fact that, of course, he was going to lose. Everybody knew that. He always loses. But um, he got more offense in than I expected. The funny part, of course, is Corey Graves is on commentary doing the, the goddamn to this Ludwig Kaiser impression I've ever heard. It was fantastic. I honestly was like, who the hell is that talking? You know, like I, was like, I literally was like, who is that? Because it was too good to be an impression. I thought like maybe my brain was fucked up and like Vinci was in the ring. Like I kept looking and then I, I think they went outside the ring for something. And uh, Corey Graves was mouth is moving and I kept hearing Ludwig Kaiser's voice like he had perfected this man's speech pattern it was very good very entertaining all of this was very entertaining Gunther called the audience degenerates that was great that was pretty awesome <laughs> <laughs> so uh, apparently Giovanni Vinci is on some kind of a 
probation because he loses a lot. But Kaiser loses pretty much every match that he's in. And he's not on probation. And he's also, you know, being pegged as the guy who should be the leader of the group at this point. <laughs> I like Kaiser. I've been saying for a long time I think Kaiser should be a breakout star. He's got a lot. The look, he's cut. He does have charisma. He does carry himself with some with some prestige. You could easily see him taking the reins of like a William Regal style character or something like that. He would kill that. He would absolutely be fantastic in that kind of role. You know, um, why they haven't, I mean, I understand why they haven't done it yet because, you know, Imperium's still working and uh, you want the guy to become a little bit more known and putting him with Gunter for a while and then breaking him out on his own later is probably for the best because Gunter is like ready right now. So, um, I'm cool with that, but I do want Kaiser to get the push later. You know, I do want him to get in that William Regal zone as the sort of snobbish European heel. And once he's no longer the mouthpiece for Gunter, he's going to be something else by himself. He's going to be very good because he's got it, you know, and I'm glad that other people are starting to see it and the crowd reaction to it. It's really working too. Something tells me that when Vince was doing the uh, the chest chops to, with uh, <laughs> Gunther was chopping Kaiser back in the, the later days of Vince McMahon's time, that that was what Vince was going towards. That he's probably going to break these two apart and push Kaiser as a solo. Of course, that would turn Kaiser babyface, and that wouldn't have worked out at all. That would have been, that'd have killed him, if you were being honest. He's a great snob heel. And I'm not so sure if he work as a baby face. Um, but I've been saying that Kaiser is, or, went back, you know, Marcel Bartel or whatever, would have been fantastic as a heel back in NXT. And I thought maybe when Gunter was called up, you know, him and Vinci should have just had a run, you know, with him being the leader of Imperium or him being the front man. And I think it would have been very, just as good. But it, I'm looking at this situation right now saying, that guy, give him another year or two. And I, especially once he goes off on his own, starts doing some solo stuff, he ought to be very good, you know, in term, especially in terms of promo. But right now, he's in a perfect spot. Gunter doesn't like to talk too much. He's not a terrible promo, but when you need somebody who sounds unique, who looks unique, um, you got Gunter, I mean, you got uh, Kaiser there. His manner of speaking is very different. And it's, you know, immediately noticeable. So that works. And he fits the gimmick, of course. I think Gunter was also um, teasing a female member of Imperium, which would be fine if we actually use other women on the roster, for Christ's sake. Well, apparently we don't. I don't see why. I think his wife, Jenny, she was a wrestler. Would she have been a good member of Imperium? I think she's retired now. I don't know, but she would have worked out as a as a valet for Imperium, you know? Like their sensational Sherry or something like that. That would be great. Most male gimmicks can be enhanced with females, if we've been honest. You know, Imperium is not really a stable that needs a girl, but she could definitely elevate them, you know? There's not quite like Los Lotharios where they need a girl, you know? But, uh... But they always tease, you know, oh, I could add this female to it. Like they did with the bloodline. It was, oh, we could we could add a girl to it. They never did, you know. <laughs> or when they do, the girl ain't got nothing to do with the stable. Like, you know, Mia Yim is added to the OC. It's like, oh, okay. Why? I, I don't know. Never got an answer to that. Oh, well, they need somebody to fight Rhea Ripley. Oh, okie dokie, but why Mia Yim of all people? Just nothing. Okay. Anyway, uh, that was Monday Night Raw. Just Monday Night Judgment Day. Oh, my God. Oh, boy. Um, there are certain people we haven't seen on this show in a long time. And uh, I don't know if the people are hurt. I don't know if they're sick. But uh, the build to SummerSlam has been meh. It's been very meh. How Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn went from main event at WrestleMania to probably not making SummerSlam at all is an absolute joke. 
I don't, <laughs> that is absolutely laughable. How these guys went from main event team WrestleMania to probably not even making SummerSlam. That's that's a joke. You know, they show it's an indictment on the tag team division. These are two guys who are super over, has been over for years, and yet you don't have a spot for them because you didn't create any tag teams. You know, you don't have any tag teams that are over. You could have had Imperium, but you had to beat them hundreds of times. You could have had Judgment Day, but you beat them a hundred times too. You know, you could have had Street Profits, beat them a hundred times. Could have had Pretty Deadly, beat them a hundred times, and not one of them is injured. You you could have had uh, uh, the LWO stable, but nope, you got to have put you got to put one of them in the U.S. title match. It's just so much terrible booking, you know, that it's really a joke, you know. Um, so I don't know, like that's that's a big punch in the jaw, you know, because you thought Triple H was actually going to put some effort into tag team wrestling and the singles titles. And he does with the Intercontinental title, put a lot of emphasis on it, but not the U S title. The U S title has been ghost town, nothing. And the tag team division outside of when the Usos dropped the belts to Sammy and Kevin, these tag team belts have been pretty invisible too. They already have been like raw exclusives. And then when it comes to Chelsea Green and Sonya Deville, I mean, what tag teams? There, there literally is none. There's tag teams in the men's division. You just don't use them. There aren't any tag teams at all in the women's division outside of maybe one. That would be KC squared. And there's nothing else. Nobody else is in a tag team. So SummerSlam is going to be a lot of, uh, in the end of a lot of trilogies. And, uh, you know, Brock and Cody, Seth and Rollins and, Roman and Jay, <clears throat> and that's really the selling point of the show. So um, they got to hit that go home show pretty hard next week, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not feeling like they're going to though. I think they're going to whiff it again and just put Judgment Day all up and through that joint and continue to overexpose them and get people sick of them. Again, you can, you can, you can overuse a good thing, you know. And I think now that you have them on NXT, you probably should pull back with them on Raw. You know, Dominic defending the title on Raw. Okay, fine. If that's what you want to do. But we still don't need them to stand in the middle of the ring and declare that they run Monday Night Raw and do all the same shit they've been doing over and over again. We don't need that. All right. Thank you guys for your time. Talk to you guys later. Peace. Bongo Slay. Best house ever, you daddy. <laughs>